a warm welcome, and thank you for joining the Winning Paths podcast family. We'd like to take a moment to express our sincere gratitude for your support and enthusiasm. Your subscription means the world to us, and we're thrilled to have you on this archery journey. At Winning Paths, part of Typham, the Irish Field Archery Monthly, we're not just an audio channel. We're a community of passionate archery enthusiasts, united by our love for this ancient and captivating sport. Whether you're a seasoned archer or just starting out, our podcast is here for you. Dive into archery's rich history with our insightful monologues, exploring fascinating moments from ancient archers to modern-day legends, lore, and myths. Our interviews feature key figures in the archery world, sharing their experiences, insights, and advice. Our hosts also aren't afraid to voice bold and sometimes thought-provoking opinions, sparking lively discussions within our community. If you're enjoying the Winning Paths podcast, be sure to subscribe on Spotify and YouTube, share it with fellow archery enthusiasts, and together we can create a vibrant hub for everything archery, a place where passion meets knowledge and every arrow finds its mark. Thank you once again for being a part of the Winning Paths family. Your support fuels our passion and we're excited to keep bringing you engaging content that resonates with the archery community. Subscribe on Spotify, follow us on YouTube, and let's continue shooting for the stars together. Tacitus once wrote in his annals, They are a people who vanish like shadows, whose arrows strike before their forms are seen, the Sarmatians, riders of the endless winds. The Sarmatians, like whispers carried across the boundless steppes, traversed the vast expanses of Eurasia from the fifth century before our era into the dawn of the Middle Ages. They were not merely nomads, but the embodiment of the horizon itself, ever distant, ever moving. These Iranian-speaking tribes wove their destinies with the threads of the wild grasses beneath them and the endless sky above, their lives a dance between the earth and the heavens. Their entire existence seemed to flow with the shifting winds that swept across the vast plains, and to understand their journey through time is to grasp the essence of impermanence that governed their way of life. Theirs was a world that moved like the currents of a river, and to stand still was to fall behind swallowed by the ceaseless march of time and the elements. Their nomadic spirit, much like the winds they rode, knew no boundaries and respected no borders, creating a perpetual motion of life and death, war and peace, conquest and retreat. Like phantoms, they drifted in and out of the historical records, their presence more often felt than seen, their deeds recorded in the annals of those they encountered rather than by their own hand. Renowned for a cavalry that seemed born of the very wind, their mastery of mounted archery was both an art and a testament to their symbiosis with nature. To the settled civilizations, they were the storm on the edge of consciousness, a force that could not be tamed or fully understood. Their influence rippled outward, shaping the martial practices and cultural landscapes from the rolling expanses of the Pontic Caspian steppe to the serene flow of the Danube. They existed in the spaces between civilizations, between the fixed and the fluid, embodying the tension between nature and humanity's attempt to impose order on it. Their power lay not in vast empires or grand cities, but in their ability to appear and disappear, striking fear into the hearts of those who tried to contain them. As with all things driven by the forces of nature, they were unpredictable, and this unpredictability was their greatest strength allowing them to shape the destiny of empires that sought to resist their encroachment. In their wake, they left not only destruction, but also an indelible cultural legacy, influencing the very fabric of warfare and governance in the regions they touched. To know the Sarmatians is to know the winds themselves, and like the winds, they defy easy understanding or categorization. In the way that a single arrow can alter the course of a battle, so too did the Sarmatians leave an indelible mark upon history a mark that we seek to trace and understand. Through the critical eyes of ancient Greek and Roman chroniclers, whose words are both windows and mirrors, we glimpse the shadows of these riders. Yet words alone cannot capture the full essence of a people who lived beyond the margins of the known world. These chroniclers, limited by their own cultural frameworks, saw the Sarmatians as both a menace and a marvel, their admiration tinged with fear, their fascination tempered by misunderstanding. As we sift through these accounts, we are reminded of the limitations of historical memory, especially when the subject of that memory is as elusive as the wind. 
the Sarmatians challenge our very conceptions of history, forcing us to reckon with the ways in which the margins of empires often hold the true pulse of a civilization's rise and fall. It is in these forgotten corners, where the forces of nature and human ambition collide, that the true story of the Sarmatians unfolds, a story that transcends mere military conquests, and speaks to the enduring human desire to remain untethered, to resist the chains of permanence that so often define civilization. Thus we reach into a mosaic of historical accounts, aware of their fractures and biases, like a traveller discerning the true path amidst misleading trails. By weaving together these narratives with the silent testimonies unearthed by archaeology, the remnants of arrowheads buried in forgotten soil, the worn bridles of horses that once thundered across plains, we aim to resurrect a nuanced portrait of the Sarmatian mounted archers. It is a task that requires not only intellectual rigour, but also a sensitivity to the gaps in the historical record, a willingness to listen to what is unsaid, to read between the lines of ancient texts, and to interpret the silent voices of the past. These remnants, though small and fragmented, speak volumes about a culture that valued speed, precision, and adaptability above all else. In the rusted metal of a forgotten arrowhead, we see the reflection of a people who lived and died by the bow, whose mastery of mounted warfare was not merely a tactic, but a way of life. This resurrection of the past is not an attempt to romanticize the Sarmatians, but rather to understand them on their own terms, to appreciate the ways in which their legacy continues to echo through the centuries, influencing the world long after their physical presence faded from the earth. This journey is as much about unearthing the past as it is about understanding the currents that connect us across time. The Sarmatians remind us that history is not a static tale, but a living dialogue between then and now, a reflection of humanity's ceaseless quest to comprehend the forces that shape our world. In exploring their legacy, we confront the echoes of our own desires for freedom, mastery, and the eternal pursuit of horizons yet unseen. Their story, though ancient, resonates with the modern human condition, revealing truths about the tension between freedom and control, movement and stasis, that continue to define our existence. As we look back, we also look forward, recognizing that the lessons of the past are never truly over. They merely transform, taking on new shapes and meanings as we evolve. The Sarmatians, in their relentless pursuit of the horizon, offer us a mirror in which we can see both our past and our future, reminding us that the quest for freedom, whether of the body, the mind, or the spirit, is a timeless endeavor. Given the paucity of written records left by the Sarmatians themselves, this study relies heavily on external accounts and archaeological evidence. Primary sources include the works of Herodotus, Tacitus, Ammianus Marcellinus, Strabo, and Jordanes. These sources, while invaluable, are approached with caution due to potential biases inherent in Greek and Roman perspectives on barbarian cultures. For instance, Herodotus's accounts, while rich in detail, often blend myth and history, necessitating careful interpretation. Tacitus and Ammianus Marcellinus, writing from a Roman standpoint, may emphasize the exotic or threatening aspects of the Sarmatians to highlight Rome's challenges. Their narratives often reflect the fear and fascination with which settled societies view nomadic peoples, casting the Sarmatians as both a threat to be vanquished and a marvel to be understood. These writings are windows into the minds of their authors as much as they are records of the Sarmatians themselves, and in interpreting them we must be mindful of the cultural lenses through which these ancient writers viewed the world. To mitigate these biases, we shall cross-reference historical narratives with archaeological findings and analyses from modern historians and archaeologists such as Tadeusz Sulemirski, Janine Davis Kimball, and Adrian Goldsworthy. By triangulating data from multiple sources, including burial sites, weapon remains, and cultural artifacts, the study aims to present a balanced and accurate portrayal of the Sarmatian mounted archers. The material evidence, though often fragmentary, serves as a counterbalance to the literary accounts, offering tangible insights into the everyday lives of the Sarmatians that the chroniclers could only speculate about. Through these combined efforts, we seek to build a fuller, more nuanced picture of a people whose legacy has been obscured by the sands of time, but whose influence remains etched in the very foundations of Eurasian history. 
In the crucible of the vast Eurasian steppes, the Sarmatians emerged as a dominant force, their society intricately woven with the art of war. Their prowess was epitomized by the mounted archer, a warrior who embodied both the elegance of mobility and the raw destructive potential of precise archery. Unlike sedentary civilizations, the Sarmatians honed their martial skills on horseback, rendering them not merely archers, but a relentless tide that overwhelmed less adaptable foes. Their archery style reflected the unforgiving terrain they inhabited, swift, ruthless, and informed by a profound understanding of both equine and human capabilities. The composite bow, their weapon of choice, was a marvel of ancient engineering. Strabo notes in his Geographica, Book 7, The Sarmatians are skilled in archery, and all their warriors fight on horseback, shooting arrows even while retreating, a tactic that confounds their enemies. This bow, constructed from wood, horn, and sinew, delivered formidable power and allowed for rapid fluid shots even at full gallop, a necessity for their high-speed skirmishing tactics. Tadeusz Sulimirski, in his authoritative work The Sarmatians, 1970, elaborates, The Sarmatian composite bow was a sophisticated weapon, reflecting a high degree of technological advancement. Its compact size made it ideal for mounted warfare, allowing archers to shoot with remarkable speed and accuracy. The construction involved precise layering of materials, providing both strength and flexibility. This innovation was central to the Sarmatians' military success and became a defining feature of their culture. The importance of the composite bow in Sarmatian society cannot be overstated. Its design maximized both range and penetration power while remaining manageable on horseback. The technological sophistication required for its manufacture underscores the advanced understanding of materials and engineering possessed by steppe societies like the Sarmatians. David Nicole, a respected historian specializing in medieval warfare, discusses this in his article, The Sarmatian Bow and Its Influence on Eastern European Archery, Journal of Military History, Vol. 57, No. 4, 1993. The Sarmatian Composite Bow was a pivotal development in the history of military technology. Its influence extended beyond their own use, impacting neighboring cultures through both conflict and trade. The bow's effectiveness lay in its combination of power and portability, which was unmatched by contemporaneous weaponry. This allowed Sarmatian-mounted archers to dominate the open battlefields of the steppes and challenge even the most disciplined infantry formations. The craftsmanship involved in creating these bows required not only technical skill, but also a deep understanding of the materials. The sinew backing added tensile strength. The horn on the belly provided compressive strength, and the wooden core maintained structural integrity. This complex construction process was a closely guarded knowledge, often passed down through generations of artisans. Michael H. Gabriel, in his study, Composite Bows in Eurasian Steppe Warfare, Arms and Armor, Vol. 5, No. 2, 2008, further explains, the production of composite bows by the Sarmatians demonstrates a sophisticated approach to weapon manufacturing. Their bows were not mere tools of war, but symbols of status and identity. The expertise required to produce such weapons indicates a society that valued and invested in technological innovation, with specialized craftsmen dedicated to this art. Mounted archery demanded an extraordinary level of synchronization between horse and rider. The archer relied on the mount's agility to evade enemy strikes, while maintaining focus on selecting and engaging targets. Ammianus Martellinus observes in his Res Geste, Book 17, The Sarmatians, on horseback, with lightning speed, shot their arrows with deadly accuracy from their swift and agile mounts. The Romans could not easily counter such a tactic, for their heavy infantry, slow to respond, became easy prey to the Sarmatians' nimble attacks. This symbiotic relationship was cultivated from youth, with training that fostered a bond ensuring remarkable accuracy, even at full speed. Archaeological evidence supports this close association. Horse burials alongside warriors indicate the esteemed status of horses within Sarmatian society. Tadeusz Sulimirski, in The Sarmatians, 1970, notes, The frequent inclusion of horse remains and elaborate horse trappings in Sarmatian graves points to the animal's critical role, not just in warfare, but in the social and spiritual lives of the people. 
Moreover, the development of specialized equipment, such as the high saddle with stirrups, though stirrups became widespread later, allowed for greater stability and control during mounted combat. This technological adaptation enhanced the effectiveness of their archery while in motion. The bow held profound cultural significance among the Sarmatians, serving as both a symbol of status and a vital tool of war. Herodotus, in his Histories, Book 4, recounts the origins of the Sauromate, Sarmatians, as descendants of Scythian men and Amazons, highlighting the role of women in their martial society. The Amazons were the wives of the Sauromate, and they were skillful riders, having been instructed in horsemanship by their husbands, the Scythians. The women shot arrows from horseback and learned from an early age the ways of war. This suggests a societal structure where martial prowess transcended gender and archery was a unifying skill among the populace. Jeanine Davis Kimball's Warrior Women, an archaeologist's search for history's hidden heroines 2002, provides archaeological corroboration. Graves of Sarmatian women containing weapons and warrior artifacts attest to their active participation in warfare. These findings challenge traditional gender roles and highlight a more egalitarian martial culture. Funerary practices further underscore the bow's importance. Bows and arrows were often interred with the dead, along with other martial accoutrements, reflecting a belief in the continuation of the warrior's journey in the afterlife. The inclusion of such items indicates the high esteem placed on martial capabilities and the integral role of archery in their identity. The Sarmatians' interactions with the Roman Empire were complex, involving both conflict and cultural exchange. Tacitus, in his Annals, Book 6, notes the trepidation the Roman legions felt toward the Sarmatian cavalry. The Sarmatian bands, swift and sudden, sent showers of arrows before they were even seen. The terrain favoured their style of war, and their retreat was as swift as their charge. Many of our legions fell, unable to reach their elusive enemy. The Roman military struggled against these tactics, necessitating adaptations in their own cavalry units. Under emperors like Marcus Aurelius, the Romans began to integrate Sarmatian methods into their military strategies. Sarmatian auxiliary units were incorporated into the Roman army, a testament to their recognized martial prowess. Adrian Goldsworthy, in his paper, The Sarmatian Influence on Roman Cavalry Development, Classical Quarterly 1994, argues, The deployment of Sarmatian auxiliaries in the Roman legions is a testament to the empire's recognition of their military prowess. The Romans learned much from their encounters with Sarmatian horse archers, leading to reforms in cavalry tactics that emphasized mobility and flexibility in battle. This integration led to a blending of steppe warfare techniques with Roman military organization, influencing the development of late Roman and Byzantine cavalry. The Notitia Dignitatum, a late Roman document, lists Sarmatian units within the Roman army, indicating their significant presence and role. As Sarmatian tactics evolved, they began to employ heavily armoured cavalry known as cataphracts. This development represented a fusion of their traditional light cavalry archery with the sheer force of armoured units. Jordanes, in The Origin and Deeds of the Goths, describes this shift. Their cataphracts, glittering in full armour, would descend upon the foe after the mounted archers had already sown discord. The earth trembled beneath their hooves, and no line could withstand the weight of their charge. This combination of tactics proved devastating, influencing both Roman and Byzantine military practices in subsequent centuries. William S. Kulikan, in Sarmatian Tactics and the Roman Response, Journal of Roman Studies 1981, elaborates, The adoption of cataphract cavalry by the Sarmatians marked a significant evolution in their military doctrine. It allowed them to exploit the weaknesses of enemy formations, destabilized by skirmishing archers, delivering a decisive blow with armoured shock troops. The cataphract was a heavily armoured horseman, often with both rider and steed clad in scale or lamella armour. This made them formidable in close combat and capable of breaking through enemy lines, especially after the opposition had been weakened by missile attacks. The Sarmatians employed a repertoire of strategies and tactics, that capitalized on their strengths in mobility and archery. Their hit-and-run tactics, feigned retreats, and encirclement maneuvers confounded more rigid military formations. Tacitus describes one such tactic in his annals. 
The Sarmatian cavalry advanced with haste, loosing their arrows in a storm upon the Roman ranks, only to vanish as swiftly as they appeared. The legions, pursuing with hope of retaliation, fell into chaos when a second wave struck from the rear, as was their custom. Their use of the feigned retreat was particularly effective in luring enemies into disarray. Ammianus Marcellinus provides a vivid account in Res Gestae. The Sarmatians divided their forces and swept like a wind upon both wings of our formation. Their arrows flew from every direction, and our men, hemmed in by their encircling horsemen, could neither advance nor retreat without suffering heavy losses. Such tactics relied on the discipline and training of their warriors, as well as the adaptability of their horses. The ability to shoot accurately while retreating or maneuvering at high speeds required exceptional horsemanship and archery skills. Their intimate knowledge of the terrain further augmented their effectiveness. Strabo remarks on their strategic use of the landscape. The Sarmatians lay in wait, their forces hidden behind the hill, and when the Romans marched unsuspecting into the valley, they struck. Their arrows darkened the sky, and the ground beneath their feet turned to mud, trapping the enemy in a morass of confusion. This utilization of the environment demonstrates a sophisticated understanding of battlefield dynamics. By selecting battlegrounds that favored their mobility and archery, they could negate the advantages of heavier infantry forces. Moreover, they often conducted campaigns during seasons unfavorable to their enemies. Their adaptability to harsh climates allowed them to launch surprise attacks when opponents were least prepared. Beyond physical tactics, the Sarmatians understood the psychological dimensions of warfare. Their sudden attacks, unpredictable movements, and the relentless hail of arrows instilled fear and confusion. Tacitus notes, Their approach was like a tempest, striking with fury, and then disappearing before a counter could be mounted. The soldiers trembled at the sight of the Sarmatian cavalry, knowing that at any moment the skies could darken with arrows. By maintaining the initiative and controlling the pace of engagements, they could demoralize opponents, leading to disorganization and defeat. The use of war cries, banners, and displays of horsemanship further amplified their psychological impact. One of the most intriguing aspects of Sarmatian society is the role of women in warfare. Herodotus's account of the Amazons merging with the Scythians to form the Sauromatae suggests that women participated as mounted archers. Archaeological findings of female burials containing weapons support this notion. Janine Davis Kimball, in Warrior Women, 2002, emphasizes, The presence of weapons in female graves indicates that Sarmatian women not only bore arms, but were active participants in warfare, challenging the traditional gender roles of their time. This egalitarian approach to martial duties may have strengthened their society's overall military effectiveness. This aspect of Sarmatian culture adds a rich dimension to our understanding of gender roles in ancient nomadic societies and their impact on social structures. It suggests a level of social flexibility that may have contributed to their resilience and adaptability. The Sarmatians' martial culture was intertwined with their spiritual beliefs. They practiced a form of animism, venerating natural elements and ancestral spirits. Weapons and horses were often consecrated through rituals, and warriors might carry amulets or charms for protection. According to Sulemirsky, religious practices among the Sarmatians were closely linked to their nomadic lifestyle. The sky god and earth goddess were central deities, symbolizing the harmony between the warrior and the natural world. Rituals often accompanied significant military endeavors, seeking divine favor. This spiritual dimension reinforced the warrior ethos and may have bolstered morale during campaigns. The Sarmatians' military innovations and cultural practices left an indelible mark on subsequent civilizations. Their influence on the Roman military apparatus is evident, but their legacy extends further. The blending of steppe warfare with established Western military traditions led to the emergence of new combat styles. William S. Culliken asserts, the Roman legions struggled with the Sarmatian cavalry primarily because their heavy infantry was ill-equipped to deal with the mobility and range of steppe warriors. The Sarmatians' use of feigned retreats and constant missile harassment required the Romans to rethink their battlefield formations. Moreover, their cultural practices, particularly the egalitarian aspects of their martial traditions, influenced neighboring societies. The image of the warrior woman persisted in folklore and myth. 
possibly contributing to the legends of chivalric female figures in medieval Europe. The Sarmatians also played a role in the ethnogenesis of various medieval peoples. Their integration with Germanic tribes, such as the Goths, and their presence in regions that would become part of the Slavic world, suggest a diffusion of cultural and military practices. In medieval Poland and Hungary, legends and heraldry reflect Sarmatian influences. The Polish nobility in the 16th and 17th centuries adopted a cultural identity known as Sarmatism, idealizing the virtues of the ancient Sarmatians and incorporating elements of their dress and customs. Their story is one of adaptability and innovation, a testament to how the mastery of a single skill, such as mounted archery, can influence the course of history. The Sarmatians exemplify the profound impact that nomadic societies have had on the development of warfare and cultural exchange across Eurasia. By integrating the martial traditions of the steppes with those of settled civilizations, the Sarmatians bridged cultural divides and left a legacy that endured long after their dominance waned. Their influence is evident not only in military tactics but also in cultural and societal developments across the regions they touched.